Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan. And we've got a pretty big update video for you today on Activision versus Blizzard. If you haven't been following this story, this all started when the state of California, through its Department of Fair Employment and Housing, brought a lawsuit for pay discrimination, sexual harassment, and more against video game publisher Activision Blizzard a few months ago. Now, as we talked about in a previous video in this playlist, the EEOC and the SEC as federal agencies were also conducting an investigation of Activision Blizzard. We still haven't heard much from the SEC that was leaked out to the Wall Street Journal, but the EEOC decided to make its move yesterday night. In this video, we talked about the fact that the EEOC doesn't actually sue a lot of businesses, but that the size of Activision Blizzard, the state of the discourse around this company might suggest that the EEOC would sue them. And that turned out to be the case. At about 6 p.m. Eastern last night, the EEOC filed this document with the United States District Court of the Central District of California suing Activision Blizzard for what? As they say, this is an action under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and Title I of the Civil Rights Act of 1991 to correct unlawful employment practices based on sex and to provide appropriate relief to a class of individuals who were adversely affected by such practices. As set forth with greater particularity in paragraphs 1 to 26 of this complaint, Plaintiff United States Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, the EEOC to you and I, alleges that there have been instances where defendants Activision Blizzard Inc., Blizzard Entertainment Inc., Activision Publishing Inc., King.com Inc., and their subsidiaries, so the Owl Hill Activision family, have subjected a class of individuals to sexual harassment, to pregnancy discrimination, and or to related retaliation under Title VII, which is the purview of the EEOC, to bring a suit under. Now, we're going to come back to those categories because... What's an important part of this story, and I think some folks have missed in reporting on it, is that the EEOC charge here, the complaint that they brought against Activision, is not remotely as broad as the lawsuit that the state of California has brought against Activision. So when we're talking about settlements, when we're talking about numbers, when we're talking about how this might have come about and what it meant for Activision Blizzard, it's important to make that distinction. It's also important to note that the EEOC had a greater charging ambit to investigate more at Activision Blizzard and apparently decided not to bring that forth in the lawsuit. Or as they say, more than 30 days prior to the institution of this lawsuit, on September 26th, 2018, which is an important date because everything that we had seen leaked about the EEOC investigation, which all came from the SEC kind of report, was that the EEOC had been investigating since 2020 last year, as a matter of fact, it has apparently been significantly longer than that. So this was a detailed investigation on the part of the EEOC. And what were they charged with investigating? Well, they say their commissioner initiated the investigation into the following allegations, including but not limited to, one, subjecting female employees to sex-based discrimination, including harassment based on their gender, two, retaliating against female employees for complaining about sex-based discrimination based on their gender, and three, paying female employees less than male employees based on their gender. And I've highlighted that because you'll want to pay attention to that third category, which we did see referenced a lot in the California lawsuit. We'll talk about it as part of this video. But it implies a systemic problem that Activision was going out and paying female employees less than male employees based on their gender. And if you recall what we saw in the categorization of this particular charge, you don't actually see that concept reflected in this charging document. But we'll see that a little bit more fulsomely as we go through it. It says the commission conducted an extensive investigation from September 26th, 2018 to June 15th, 2021 of the allegations of sexual harassment and related retaliation against defendants and additional entities beyond the charge at their work sites in the United States. On June 15th, 2021, so a few months ago, the commission issued to defendants a letter of determination finding reasonable cause on the claims alleged in this complaint. As required by statute, the commission invited defendants to engage in 
conciliation efforts to endeavor to eliminate the discriminatory practices and provide appropriate relief. Conciliation here is how you or I might think of settlement talks. The commission engaged in extensive conciliation discussions with defendants, but the commission was unable to secure through informal methods an acceptable conciliation agreement. And as we talked about in the prior video on this, we can see how the EEOC works, how the statute requires them to work. They get a charging document from somebody that is complaining about discrimination at their place of work. They investigate it. At the end of the investigation, the EEOC makes a determination on the merits of the charge. If the EEOC determines there is reasonable cause to believe discrimination has occurred, both parties are issued a letter of determination telling them that there is that reason to believe that discrimination occurred. And then the EEOC is required by Title VII to attempt to resolve findings of discrimination on charges through that conciliation process. If it falls through, the EEOC must decide whether to sue the employer in court. In fiscal year 2014, which as we talked about in our earlier video is the latest that I could find a report on the EEOC on this particular topic, conciliation failed in about 1,700 charges. And in that same year, they decided to bring 133 lawsuits. So the vast bulk of times when conciliation fails, the employer walks away from the EEOC. I did get a comment that was entirely appropriate that said the EEOC can then give the right to sue to the individual that brought the original charge in question, and they often do. So there can still be lawsuit issues for the employer, but the EEOC isn't regularly bringing these suits. Activision Blizzard was an exception last night. And what do they believe that they found? Well, that's all in this one set of paragraphs. It says employees were subjected to sexual harassment that was severe or pervasive to alter the conditions of employment. The conduct was unwelcome and adversely affected the employees. Defendants knew or should have known of the sexual harassment of the adversely affected employees. Some employees complained about the sexual harassment, but defendants failed to take corrective and preventative measures. Once defendants knew or should have known of the sexual harassment of the adversely affected employees, defendants failed to take prompt and effective remedial action reasonably calculated to end that harassment. Further, defendants discriminated against employees due to their pregnancy that adversely affected the employees. That's the only line we get on that, so we don't know what form that discrimination took. And then defendants retaliated against employees who engaged in protected activity, including rejecting or complaining about harassment, complaining about pregnancy discrimination. And as a result of that particular retaliation, they may have been discharged or constructively discharged. When you see constructive discharge referenced in one of these documents, that means that the circumstances of their employment were made so impalatable by their employer that the law can say that they were effectively fired. Oh, we're going to make sure that you have to drive at least 50 miles to do what you do. We're going to give you horrible hours. We're going to do these other things that that amounts to a termination for purposes of laws like this one. So that's what the EEOC charged. They asked for an injunction in joining defendant from violating the law effectively to carry out policies, practices, and programs to ensure equal employment opportunities and eradicate the effects of prior unlawful employment practices and money. Order defendants to make the adversely affected employees whole by provo- providing back pay, by providing compensation for pecuniary losses, monetary losses, and non-pecuniary losses. So money, change in policies, and an injunction against violating the law. And that's really what the EEOC can do. If you go to their website and you look at many, many, many of their about pages or things that I haven't included directly in this video, the EEOC is charged with trying to make folks whole. They aren't as interested in kind of the punitive damages or punishment aspect. They're trying to eradicate discrimination, get people their back pay, get them their damages for whatever they might have been affected by directly, change the policies of the company that had these issues and move on from there. But it's also important to note how much smaller this charging set is than the state of California, right? And how it's framed here. The defendants knew or should have known of the sexual harassment is not the same as what California accused Activision Blizzard of doing, which was essentially being malicious and fraudful and deceitful and essentially systematically discriminating against all women. When this is really talking about women that directly experienced harassment, directly experienced discrimination based on their pregnancy, and those that then got retaliated against for complaining about it or rejecting the sexual harassment advances or whatever it might be. This is much more focused on a class of people that were directly affected. 
And if we go and we look at the original video in this series, California versus Activision, you can see how much broader California's claims are, right? Just looking at the very first one, sex discrimination, talking about employment. California says defendants have engaged in and continue to perpetuate discriminatory practices regarding pay, assignment, promotion, and other terms and conditions which negatively affect and impact female employees as a group. These discriminatory practices begin at hiring when women were offered lower compensation and less lucrative job assignments. The pay disparity continued throughout employment for female employees. Women were also afforded less stock and incentive pay opportunities. Women were steered into the lower levels of defendant's hierarchy and often had to work harder and longer to earn equal promotion. In another example, a female employee who worked at Blizzard was assigned to a lower level, denied equal pay, and passed over for a promotion. Similarly, other female employees were assigned to lower level roles. Female employees were also assigned to lower level roles at Activision Publishing. Female employees were also not promoted because of defendants' discriminatory practices against pregnant female employees. This is paragraph 39. This is one place where the EEOC charging document matches up. A female employee working on one game team had assumed some of the responsibilities of a manager, but when she asked her male supervisor about being fairly paid for the work she was actually doing and promoted into that position, the manager commented that they could not risk promoting her as she might get pregnant and like being a mom too much. Now, that's actually essentially proto-pregnancy, pre-pregnancy, pregnancy as a possibility, which is even more significant than actually discriminating against someone that is actively pregnant. So Activision Blizzard's got a problem here, not just with the state of California, but now kind of backstopped by the EEOC. But that's where that backstop kind of ends. If we go and we look at how California actually framed this, it's as a systematic problem. Defendants intentionally discriminate against women in compensation, as a result of defendants' unlawful employment practices, female employees suffered and continue to suffer harm, including lost earnings, lost benefits, lost future employment opportunities, and other financial loss. And defendants' actions were willful, malicious, fraudulent, and oppressive, and were committed with the wrongful intent to injure female employees. California framed this as Activision Blizzard deliberately doing these kinds of things. And when you talk about the EEOC document, you see an agency of the federal government that's initial investigation was to look into whether or not Activision Blizzard was paying female employees less than male employees based on their gender. And you don't see that reflected in what they actually bring as a charging document at all. And that's going to be even more important as we continue with this video, because what we are going to see is they're going to settle and release all claims arising from this charge number 480-2018-05212. And that's going to include as they say, not just these three things, but at least these three things, including their investigation into pay disparity, which they didn't even put into the charging document. And while the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence, that could speak to what we can expect from the California document, which if you recall, as we went through it in our initial iteration, is predominantly about systematic pay discrimination and less so about that harassment angle. So the state of California has to be looking at what happened with the EEOC over the last 24 hours or so with great interest because it does suggest that that agency didn't find the systemic discrimination on the basis of pay that California based a lot of its case on and where, to be honest, the real money lives because harassment, pregnancy discrimination, retaliation are all very specific, specific claimants, specific cases, all of which are very bad, all of which Activision Blizzard should pay for, but they don't get to this level of a systematic failure at the company and something that could really, really damage them. So I think overall that charging document, while bad, may be a silver lining if you're sitting in Activision HQ as to what happened in respect of what they actually claimed. Now, as you might know, either from the, th the thumbnail or otherwise, while the EEOC filed that lawsuit at about 6 p.m., at about 7 p.m., Activision Blizzard puts out this press release. Activision Blizzard commits to expanded workplace initiatives, reaches agreement with the EEOC. Now, you might not ever see a settlement this fast again in your life. This was filed about an hour before a fulsome settlement document was put forth. It's a document we will, of course, take a look at. And figuring out what happened is part of the game here. I don't think that we can know 100% sitting here on the outside why that occurred the way it did, whether it was because 
Activision Blizzard wasn't willing to sit down with the EEOC, didn't believe that the EEOC would actually file a lawsuit, and the EEOC went forward with it in order to establish that they did have the capability of filing that lawsuit, and that ultimately brought Activision Blizzard to the table, or that both parties wanted that lawsuit out there so that everybody could see exactly what was being settled, and that was somehow beneficial to the release terms in the settlement agreement. Reasonable minds can differ on that score. You or I aren't going to know that unless we happen to be in that room or a fly on the wall of that room, but it's still very, very interesting. So let's read about it. Activision Blizzard today confirmed that as part of its effort to have the most welcoming, inclusive workplace, it has reached an agreement with the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission to settle claims and to further strengthen policies and programs to prevent harassment and discrimination in the company's workplace. Under the agreement, the principal terms of which are summarized in attachment A to this press release, Activision Blizzard has committed to create an $18 million fund to compensate and make amends to eligible claimants. Commenting on the agreement, Activision Blizzard CEO Bobby Kotick said, There is no place anywhere at our company for discrimination, harassment, or unequal treatment of any kind, and I am grateful to the employees who bravely shared their experiences. I am sorry that anyone had to experience inappropriate conduct, and I remain unwavering in my commitment to make Activision Blizzard one of the world's most inclusive, respected, and respectful workplaces. And you can take that for whatever weight you want to give it, but the upshot is the EEOC sues at 6 p.m. and the suit gets settled at 7 p.m. with about an $18 million expense on the Activision side of things. Now, we're going to talk about how that's been perceived in various journalistic outlets. Activision's obviously a much bigger company than that $18 million. But before we get into the settlement decree itself, it is important to note that the EEOC is operating under statutory limits for what they can go and ask for, for violations of these particular laws. And I've pulled up that law. It says the sum of the amount of compensatory damages awarded under this section for future losses, emotional pain, suffering, inconvenience, mental anguish, loss of enjoyment of life, and other non-pecuniary losses, and the amount of punitive damages, that penalty amounts that are just established to try to make Activision hurt so that they don't do this again, shall not exceed for each complaining party, which in this case would be anyone with a complaint for sexual harassment, pregnancy discrimination, or retaliation for either of those things. It will not exceed for any one individual $300,000. And this is actually a sliding scale. This goes down if you have fewer employees, but Activision Blizzard's in the biggest category. They have 10,000 or so employees. So it won't exceed $300,000. So when we talk about an $18 million settlement, if you gave it the max amount here, that would cover about 60 instances of harassment or discrimination, which to be frank, is a lot of discrimination and a lot of harassment. And I don't know what the EEOC is looking at. I don't know what Activision Blizzard is looking at, but it's important to understand this when we talk about what the EEOC can do. And you might think, you might sit back and say, Rick, regardless of what you say here, that's a sillyly small amount for an Activision Blizzard that makes a billion dollars a quarter, has $60 billion market cap, whatever it might be. And you're not wrong. It's unlikely to change the way that they are operating just by virtue of this amount of money. But the EEOC's primary focus is getting that recompense for the people that are actually directly affected. California is doing something different. California might win. We don't know. We don't know what we don't know on this score. And we'll have an update on the timing of that case at the very, very end of this video. But in respect to the EEOC, this is about what you could expect. So let's take a look at that consent decree. If you aren't familiar with the term consent decree, it's essentially a settlement agreement that includes a court-enforced injunction. The court will get a say on approving this, but it does appear to be part and parcel of this entire use of the court system to put that action in place, to have a settlement decree enforced by a court, and then to have it all be a part of a court process. So it's likely that the court will approve this, but the court, as we've talked about in virtual legality, has a general equitable power to say, nope, I don't like this. It doesn't really have the power to modify it, uh, and the parties would have to come back with something that was modified, but it could just reject this if it felt that it was unfair to the situation as presented. Now, as part of a consent decree, you get some of the benefits that Activision would be looking for from part of this process, including a paragraph like this one. Defendants, that's Activision Blizzard to you and I, 
expressly deny that they subjected any individual or group of individuals to sexual harassment, pregnancy discrimination, or related retaliation, deny all allegations of wrongdoing, liability, damages, and entitlement to other relief set forth in the action, deny any group or systemic discrimination or harassment, that's just for California, the EEOC didn't charge that, and deny that any of their policies and procedures are inadequate. We think we're fine. We are not admitting to a systemic problem. However, the parties recognize that through this decree, the parties can avoid the expense, distraction, and possible litigation associated with such a dispute. And thus the parties wish to resolve all issues through this decree. And in all honesty, this is what the EEOC is charged with doing. If you go to their pages, you see this is how they characterize the advantages of a settlement in the first instance. They say charges of discrimination may be settled at any time during the investigation. EEOC investigators are experienced in working with the parties to reach satisfactory settlements. Voluntary settlement efforts can be pursued at any time during the investigation. There is no admission of liability, and it avoids the lengthy and unnecessary litigation runtime. So the EEOC goes out there and through its conciliation process, through its settlement process, says, we're going to ask for some things. If you give us these things, we are going to not require you to admit that you were wrong. We're not going to require you to do that as part of a settlement. We're going to try to get these people their money. And this is essentially a balancing kind of question. If you go to law school, you'll see a lot of these in statutes and legal frameworks, and you don't have to disagree with the balancing or agree with it that the legislature has put out for the EEOC. But ultimately, right now, they're operating under an ambit that says, we want to try to help those people that were affected first and foremost, fix the employer second, and not worry about admissions of liability or public punishment or anything like that. Get people fixed, get the company fixed first and foremost. And that's what they've tried to do with this consent decree. It says the parties have entered into this decree for the following purposes, to provide appropriate monetary and injunctive relief, to ensure that defendants' employment practices comply with pertinent laws, to ensure that defendants maintain workplaces free of sexual harassment, pregnancy discrimination, and related retaliation, to ensure that defendants take reasonable steps to prevent and correct those things, to review and update defendants' policies, practices, and procedures, to review and ensure effective training for defendants' employees, to ensure proper accountability and effective handling of complaints, to ensure appropriate review and reporting, and, of course, to avoid the time and expense and uncertainty of possible litigation to address the findings made by the EEOC in its letter of determination. Now, in the definitions here, we once again see reference to the fact that it includes Activision Blizzard Publishing, Blizzard King, and the whole Activision family and their subsidiaries. And I like to give the disclaimer here where I do say, hey, my brother works at one of those subsidiaries. I haven't been named in any of these kinds of things. Uh, but if you want to view that as a, as a bias or a tilt on this score, and whichever way you might go with that bias or tilt, I'd be interested to, to find out. I want you to have that information because they do have that relationship. There's, of course, big moves in this particular case. I do not consult with him on this topic. I don't think that's fair to him. I don't discuss it with him at all. But I do have that relationship, so I do know somebody that works in this group of defendants. Continuing, the EEOC consultant is an important term. It's the third party equal employment opportunity consultant agreed to by the parties. Not terribly helpful in the definitions term, but this is going to be the person that's effectively working for the EEOC on the inside of Activision Blizzard. Then we get the eligible claimant definition, which kind of highlights what I was talking about with respect to the charging document. These are the people that are going to get paid out of that $18 million. It's a claimant who, in the EEOC's sole discretion, meets all of the following requirements. One, had to be employed by Activision Blizzard since September 1st, 2016 to the effective date. Based on the EEOC's assessment, could assert a claim for harassment, discrimination, retaliation, or constructive discharge, sexual harassment, and pregnancy discrimination in particular. And then such eligible claimants will be eligible for monetary relief as determined by the EEOC. So the EEOC goes in, figures out what compensatory damages are, really to give recompense. How were you harmed? What back pay did you lose? What money did you expend on therapy or whatever else it might be? We can get you that money. Then is punitive money appropriate for this particular purpose? And as we mentioned, they're capped. We talked about the cap. Punitive awards are only supposed to be given when the employer in question acted with malice or reckless indifference, you don't see those terms in the charging document. You don't see them in the consent decree. It's unclear exactly whether the SEC, the EEOC, I've got a lot of lettered agencies in my head on these kinds of scores, would actually add punitive damages to that number. So it could be more than 60, could be less than 60. We don't know what the eligible claimants number is going to be. It's all going to be administered by the EEOC. Effectively, 
Activision Blizzard is going to put $18 million into a lockbox and it's going to coordinate the claimant's filings, but the EEOC is going to determine what amount of money they get. But it's specific. It's not systemic. It's you actually had to experience sexual harassment or pregnancy discrimination or retaliation or constructive discharge in order to be eligible to go claim a certain amount of money from that fund. The settlement fund we see is the $18 million we saw discussed in the press release. And then this is why Activision Blizzard signs one of these. Release of claims. The parties agree that this decree completely and finally resolves all allegations, issues, and claims raised by the EEOC against defendants made in the action, the charging document, including charge number 480-2018-05212, which as we talked about, is the charging document which had them investigating, among other things, that systematic pay disparity, which we didn't see charged. So this document is releasing Activision of an EEOC complaint against that particular topic as well as every other topic. Nothing in this decree is nor should be construed as an admission of wrongdoing or liability by defendants, either in the proceeding or any other proceeding. And nothing in this decree constitutes nor should be construed as constituting the imposition of any penalty against defendants. This is just two crazy kids got together, decided to give one of them $18 million because they maybe filed a lawsuit against them. Maybe we're investigating them for three years. But hey, nobody admits to anything. Activision Blizzard's given the $18 million, but they also have some other things they need to do. One, this decree in no way affects the EEOC's right to bring process, investigate, or litigate charges that may be in existence or may later arise against defendants other than the claims brought in this action. So you get into an argument as to whether or not they released in full the charging document or they didn't release the charge based on pay disparity. I couldn't tell you what exactly that means in terms of practice, but it looks like the EEOC maybe could find another investigation point and and maybe could piggyback off of California in the future. We don't know on that particular score. And it's going to stay in effect for three years. Now you might say, well, they're, they're paying $18 million. What stays in effect for three years? A whole lot of stuff. This is a 53-page document. Almost all of the pages are about how Activision Blizzard needs to interact with the EEOC and what this individual, the EEO consultant, is going to do acting internally at Activision Blizzard. So first we start out, right? The EEOC gets to review compliance. Defendants agree that the EEOC can review compliance with this decree. They can audit the company. The EEOC may request that defendants permit the EEOC to interview employees. For this three-year period, they're essentially under probation. The EEOC can swoop in and investigate whatever they want. The parties expressly agree that if defendants have failed to comply with this decree, the EEOC may seek to enforce it, seeking all available relief, an extension of the decree, costs, attorney's fees, etc. Now, we get into the active things that Activision Blizzard actually has to do. They have to pay that $18 million. We know that. We then get pages and pages and pages of how this is actually to operate in practice. Who gets in mail? What information do you get about the potential claimants? How this all works? They have 120 days once they get a notice of settlement to actually file the thing. And oh, by the way, since if you accept this money, you will be releasing Activision Blizzard of certain claims, all eligible claimants shall be provided an opportunity to consult an independent attorney to advise on the release of claims to which the EEOC is not a party. Defendants shall pay for up to one hour of attorney consultation to advise on the release of claims at the rate of $450 an hour for each eligible claimant, which I should note is higher than my rate here at Hoag Law. But either way... Activision Blizzard is going to be paying for an hour of attorney consultation because a release document is an important document and these eligible claimants are going to have to sign a release form in order to get their money out of that particular block. Now, do they have to release everything on California and everything else? No, it's going to relate to the EOC primarily, but it might relate to more and that's why you would need an outside counsel to review it for you. Important to note since they're setting up $18 million, they don't exactly know who's going to claim it, who the EEOC is going to find eligible, for how much they're going to find them eligible to take. If any of the settlement fund remains undistributed after exhausting the efforts to locate the eligible claimants as set forth above, the excess funds will be distributed between a Cypress fund for distribution to charitable organizations whose mission involves advancing women in the video game and technology industries or promoting awareness around sexual harassment and gender equality issues, so to charity, and the diversity and inclusion fund to be used by defendants exclusively for diversity, inclusion, and equity efforts beyond the scope and terms of this decree. The allocation between the Cyprus fund and diversity and inclusion fund will be decided by defendants. Cyprus just meaning excess over a settlement fund. 
but subject to approval by the EEOC, which will not be unreasonably withheld. So you might read that and say, hey, Rick, doesn't that say Activision Blizzard is going to fund something for $18 million if, say, only $8 million comes out of it and they have $10 million left? Activision Blizzard can decide how much of that to give to charity and how much of that to keep as long as they get to spend that money on diversity and inclusion fund efforts? Yes, you would be right. And in fact, the EEOC has said they're not going to unreasonably withhold their approval of the split there. So Activision Blizzard, despite the big top line number of $18 million, might not even be losing that $18 million because they're going to have to do some diversity, inclusion, and equity stuff, either as California or EEOC or somebody else. So if they keep that money and they spend it for those purposes, then they actually didn't give it away at all. And they're spending it for some reason that they would have had to in any event. So that probably doesn't make you thrilled if you're looking to see Activision Blizzard really suffer for this, but that is the way that the EEOC has structured it. Then we get some claimant-specific injunctive relief. This would be the, the women that have been affected by that harassment or discrimination, and Activision Blizzard agrees to remove from their personal files the, any issues related to the whole uh, harassment, discrimination, or retaliation concepts, reclassify them as voluntary resignations if they were retaliated against, ensure that they are not prohibited from re-employment with defendants other than for non-discriminatory and non-retaliatory reasons. And those folks, this is standard in a case like this or a settlement like this, are going to get you know better treatment in their personnel files for what has been found to be illegal activity uh, on the part of Activision Blizzard, or at least what they're willing to do without admitting to engaging in such illegal activity. Then, as I promised, the $18 million is not where Activision's promises to the EEOC end. In fact, they're just where they begin. Activision is going to have an EEOC individual, or at least a third party approved by the EEOC acting within their space. What are they going to be doing? Well, first, Activision Blizzard has to agree to be enjoined from engaging in discrimination, engaging in a practice that creates a hostile work environment, creating, facilitating, or permitting a hostile work environment, enjoined from doing things that would amount to retaliation. Effectively, they're enjoined from violating the law, which, as you might already understand, you and I are enjoined from violating the law already as it stands, because if we violate the law, we're going to be in trouble. But the equal opportunity consultant or equal employment opportunity consultant is where the rubber hits the road here for what Activision Blizzard is going to have to deal with for the next three years. It says defendants will retain a third party EEO consultant approved by the EEOC with demonstrated experience in the areas of preventing and combating gender discrimination, harassment, and related retaliation. The EEOC consultant shall have access to documents and employees and shall review defendants compliance with the provisions of this decree. And that's what they do in broad strokes, but we can see kind of more specifics throughout the rest of this document, 30 pages or so. The EEOC consultant will conduct audits. They'll review defendant's centralized tracking system or complaint log. They'll evaluate pregnancy discrimination complaints. They'll review defendant's policies and procedures and methods for communicating to employees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Activision Blizzard will also hire or designate, more likely, a coordinator to help the EEO consultant actually do their job. The coordinator will prepare the complaint log for review by the consultant, prepare materials for the consultant's consideration and review, et cetera, et cetera. So Activision Blizzard is going to hire and pay for somebody. It's going to work for the EEOC, reading through their documents and complaint logs and advising them on certain things. And they're going to designate probably one of their HR representatives to effectively be their right hand to help that EEO consultant get that documentation and do these investigations for three years or potentially more. The EEO consultant shall evaluate the adequacy of investigations conducted, evaluate the consistency of disciplinary measures taken, recommend appropriate preventative steps to avoid recurrence of the same or similar issues. There'll be annual audits. The EEO consultant can conduct unannounced audits of current employees outside the presence of management. So they can just drop in and talk to folks. If deemed necessary by the consultant, climate surveys may be administered where through the audits, it is determined that additional information is needed to determine whether there are ongoing issues of sexual harassment, pregnancy discrimination, and or related retaliation. So you're going to have somebody internal to Activision Blizzard effectively working for the EEOC, able to talk to employees at their discretion, able to conduct massive surveys across the company. Defendants will work with the EEO consultant to review their existing workplace policies and procedures and revise them if necessary. There's a whole laundry list of things that need to be included in that kind of employee handbook set of documents, including a strong and clear commitment to a workplace free of discrimination. Now, 
if you've been with us in virtual legality for a while and you looked at, for instance, the investor complaint against Activision Blizzard, you know that a lot of this stuff that's referenced here is in the handbook, is in the policies and procedures of Activision Blizzard. That's why one of the things you see here is we'll revise it if necessary. Activision Blizzard appears to have most of the right words in their documents for these kinds of things. We care about discrimination, everybody's accountable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those are and continue to be words on the page, but they are important words. And so the EEOC is going to be looking at them as well. Defendants will work with the EEO consultant to review their internal complaint procedure, including making sure that there's a statement encouraging employees to ask questions and share concerns, a clearly described process for submitting complaints, a clearly described process for prompt, thorough, and impartial investigation, etc., etc. And if you've been in a work environment in the last little while, you'll recognize these. There'll be compliance trainings. Defendants agree that they will require all supervisory employees to attend an interactive and or live compliance training lasting at least two hours in duration. Same with HR and investigation folks. In terms of non-supervisory employees, they'll have a one hour training that they'll have to go through. And all trainings described above shall be mandatory for the duration of this decree. So they'll be periodic as required by the EEOC. There'll be adjustments to the complaint log. There'll be changes to the way performance evaluation forms are put forth to the employees at Activision Blizzard, again, acting under the ambit of the EEO consultant. Activision Blizzard will make sure that they have a hotline in place seven days a week, 24 hours a day to report complaints. They'll keep proper records, which you might remember from earlier in the playlist was an issue that California had that Activision Blizzard was destroying records. You don't see that in the EEOC complaint. You don't see it in their charging document, but they do have what is pretty boilerplate and standard of a concept here. You're going to keep the records that we would need to review to do any of these things to comply with this decree. You'll report to us how you're going to do all these things at the beginning, and then you'll report to us every six months and at the end of the decree. So you got a lot of paperwork to do. You got a lot of hiring costs with respect to the consultant. You're going to have to designate an individual to help coordinate the consultant's activities. And of course, you're going to pay $18 million, which isn't nothing. Now you do see folks complaining about it. You do see folks like Steven Totillo at Axios say, yes, the company's operating income for its most recent financial quarter was $959 million. You do see Eurogamer's headline here today, billion dollar firm Activision Blizzard agrees to $18 million fund to compensate and make amends. But it is important to recognize what the EEOC could even do here. And most importantly, I know a number of you came to me and asked me about this. It doesn't settle California. It doesn't settle whether or not they'll have any trouble with the National Labor Relations Board, which we covered, or with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Although it is worth noting, as we talked about in that earlier video, the Securities and Exchange Commission is concerned about making sure that Activision Blizzard disclosed things that were material to its operations. And certainly, if anything is reflected in the articles, and I think they're correct, $18 $18 million is not material to Activision Blizzard's ongoing operations. It is not a drop in the bucket to even a quarter of their income and nothing in respect of their assets. So the SEC's job got harder in respect of claiming that potentially the EEOC investigation was something that they would have to disclose to investors because it really didn't change much of anything. Now, maybe the argument could be made that the operational aspect of having a consultant there being on probation from the EEOC for at least three years is enough to have to disclose. Certainly they'll disclose it now, having entered into the consent decree. But at the investigation stage, it's a hard case to make for the SEC and it's harder having seen what Activision Blizzard ultimately agreed to. But this isn't the end of all things. And as I said, even in this video, I pointed folks to the fact that the federal government is always gonna be implied by their statute or otherwise to seek settlement, to seek conciliation. They don't have enough resources to look at every company in the country. The EEOC statute says that. The SEC statute says that. Even the DFEH statute in California says that. That's one of Activision Blizzard's complaints. But it was always going to be the biggest deal in California as presented in that case. They're the ones that claim systematic issue, willful malfeasance, fraud, oppressiveness. And so you always wanted to keep your eye on that. And I think a lot of you have done that, which is why one of the comments, and I'll leave you with this in this video, that I've received a lot 
is when is Activision going to answer any of this stuff? Rick, you promised me that they had 30 days, there could be extensions, that they'd have to answer what the state of California accused them of. They would file this document to respond, explain why what California alleged wouldn't be illegal. And as we found out yesterday, just before all of the EEOC craziness, was that Activision has actually stated that they get an extra right, and we'll talk about that in just a second, to not file their response document, which isn't an answer, we'll talk about that as well, by October 22nd, so a couple of extensions. Now, again, Stephen Totillo doing good work at Axios found this document, and it says a couple of things, one of which is that they are intending to file a document called a demurrer. And if you aren't familiar with that term, I don't blame you. I don't think a lot of lawyers necessarily are familiar with that term. It effectively means that they are planning to tell the court that something that California has filed, even if you assume that it is true, doesn't actually meet the test for establishing an illegal action or what we would call a cause of action in that document. That if you assume everything they said is right, they didn't meet the elements of whatever the statute might require for X, Y, or Z. And it doesn't have to be applicable to every aspect of the document that California brought, but it means that we're going to try to say something doesn't work here and ask California primarily to amend their document. Now, because California doesn't want to waste time in court proceedings, having a demurrer filed, having the state of California or anyone else amend right before there would be a hearing on that demurrer, et cetera, et cetera, they added a couple of years ago a statute that says you two, if you're going to plan to file a demurrer, you two parties are going to get together and you're going to discuss what the problem with the pleading is so that the plaintiff can fix their pleading and not waste the court's time. So here we have in this declaration from the Activision side of things, a statement of what happened. They say on Friday, September 17th, we went, uh, or on September 16th, I apologize, I emailed counsel to the DFEH, California, to request to meet and confer pursuant to California Code of Civil Procedure to determine whether an agreement can be reached that would resolve the demurrer objections the counsel for the DEF, uh, DFEH got back to me the next day, said we won't be able to do a conference until September 30th or October 6th, which was past our deadline to file, which at that point was September 23rd. And so they didn't respond, they didn't respond. And then you get to the second part of this, which says in an effort to complete the required good faith meet and confer process in advance of filing the demurrer, and given the DFEH is unavailable to do so, Activision submits this declaration pursuant to the code extending the deadline to file its demurrer by 30 days to October 22nd, 2021. And I did a thread on this on Twitter. You can see in the statute that that seems pretty automatic. If they don't meet at least five days prior to the pleading being due, you get an automatic 30-day extension. And if it still is continuing to happen, they can ask for additional extensions of the court's time. So as of the timing of the California case, what I call in other places, the big one, that you won't be seeing an Activision demurrer complaint at least until late October. And once that is settled up in court, you won't see an answer from Activision Blizzard until at least probably a couple weeks after that point in time. And you can accuse Activision Blizzard of playing for time or filing paperwork or using technicalities. We don't know what we don't know. It's possible that the state of California really did have pleading uh, faults. As we talked about when we looked through their initial document, there was a lot of uh, overly rhetorical flourishing speech uh, that might have caused problems for their pleadings. We don't know. Or if you're more inclined to think Activision Blizzard is just hiding behind its lawyers, they're playing for time here. And with a demurrer and then a, and then a meeting that the state of California can't meet and a 30-day automatic extension, they're pushing that answer out until potentially November or even later. So that's the state of play here. Activision isn't going to be responding on the merits of California's complaint for another couple of months yet uh, because of what's happening in terms of process. But Even that is more important, I think, than the EEOC investigation, lawsuit and settlement, the SEC investigation. We don't know what the NLRB is ultimately going to do. No matter what anybody tells you, it's not a lawsuit as of yet. Uh, And so that's the state of play on a very crazy day of Activision Blizzard. The EEOC very likely to be no more a part of this story after the court approves that consent decree, but still a lot more to come. This has been Virtual Legality for today. If you did enjoy discussing the business and law of video game companies, technology, and more, please consider supporting the channel. We've got a Patreon for support and other methods of supporting the channel in the description, or 
just subscribing, upvoting, downvoting, leaving comments, telling your friends, posting these videos on forums is very, very helpful and much appreciated by me. If you caught this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.